Cool. Yeah. Thanks for the invitation. I'll let you all move a little closer. <laughs> So you can all see a little bit of the projector as well? Cool. Yeah, so my name is Bjorn. I'll, I'll be giving a talk on innovation ecosystem design in the nonprofit sector. Uh, and I read an article not too long ago um, that's quoted down here that said that in the past 50 to 60 years, there were around 2 trillion euros spent in de development aid for Africa. Uh, and the interesting thing is that there's no scientific uh, data that, there, that this has had any impact on, on the continent. There's even some scientists that say it had a negative impact, and I couldn't wrap my head around it because I thought that's so much money. I mean, you, you would have to do something amazing with it. And I think the reason is if you look at uh, how you build a startup, and I, I'm sure Ecosia was similar. First, you sort of identify a market opportunity, then you do the business model search, so this can take a long time until you actually found a way that works, and then you sort of reach product market fit, and then you grow, just like Ecosia seems to be doing now if this office is too small. Um, and what a lot of uh, um, nonprofits do is that they have to write a project plan to get the funding, so they jump through step one and step two, and they sort of start by writing down what their plan is, they say how many employees they want to have, and then either they get the money, and then they go from zero employees to ten, and then they have this project money for two years, and then it may go on, it may be prolonged, but a lot of the times it isn't. Um, so it's, it's sort of that, um, uh, it, it, it's, that's sort of, in my opinion, the main problem that um, you sort of jump through step one and two and basically start with three. There's one really good example. It's called the roundabout play pump. Has any one of you ever heard about it? Okay, so this, where the children are playing on the playground is connected to a water tank up here. So the children are playing down here and that pumps water into the water tank, which sounds amazing, right? So it's a fantastic idea. Children are playing, you get a lot of water, awesome. But there's a Guardian article that said that this project has been criticized as being far too expensive, too complex for local maintenance, over-reliant on child labor, and based on flawed water demand calculations. So they found out that if you would have to want to go to uh, clean drinking water for up to 10 million people with 4,000 pumps, children would have to be playing nonstop for 27 hours a day. So <laughs> it, it actually didn't work. But they actually built 1,000 of these pumps until press was so bad that they sort of said, okay, we sort of need to yeah, reevaluate what we're doing. And that actually shows a lot of the problems that you have in the nonprofit sector. So one is you have a donor focus. This sounds really appealing to donors, it sounds awesome, but they didn't validate the business or the impact model at all. So they just sort of scaled without having any proof of concept. Often they use waterfall development. If you write a project plan, you have to plan for two or three years in advance and you have sequential deliverables. So you say what you do in the first year, what you do in the second year and what you do in the third year, which of course is the opposite of innovation because you, you basically do, uh, there's a book called Lean Impact. She calls it the enforced waterfall model. It's not just that you're doing waterfall, but it's that you're planning your waterfall development for two or three years in advance, depending on how long the project's going. Also, they use a lot of the times vanity metrics that sound awesome. So they said we want to have clean drinking water for up to 10 million people with 4,000 pumps. But I mean, up to 10 million people could be anything, right? It's, it's, they're just sort of giving a limit without basically saying how much exactly wanna, they want to produce, but also they don't validate any of this. And then premature scaling is basically what I said earlier that they sort of scale uh, without any proof of concept, and there's a study by the Genome Report saying that 70% of all startups die because they scale prematurely, so they do a lot of marketing without the product actually working. And I believe that in the non-profit sector, uh, if you would measure it, it would be even higher. What you have to do as well, though, in the non-profit sector, it can be, uh, there's a lot of different, let's say, archetypes. So you have some social businesses that have a business model, like Ecosia, for example, um, and then you, of course, also have uh, sustainable companies who just offer a sustainable pro product. So Einhorn, for example, uh, and selling condoms that are made organically would also sort of fall 
uh, in, in, in this category. Then you have project funding. So if you want to get money from the government or from foundations, often you have to write a project plan in advance and then uh, it, it becomes tricky. And then donations, like large organizations like Greenpeace, get a lot of donations from individual con uh, contributors. Um, so with a social business and with donations, you don't really have money restrictions on the money you have coming in. Whereas if you get project run funding from the government and foundations, you have, have a lot of restrictions through the deliverables, but also through the amount of people that you can hire and, and a few other things. So I've previously worked at Kyren. Um, Kyren is a nonprofit that uh, provides refugees with access to education. Um, and I worked there up until August last year and then switched my job to Schule im Aufbruch, which is a network of more than 100 schools with a focus on sustainability, project-based learning, and future skills. And what I'll share with you today, though, is the transformation that we've gone through uh, at Kyren, where I facilitated the change process. And it all started in April uh, 2018. Um, so we sort of iterated through the organizational development, similar how you would iterate on a product. And in April, um, we, we sort of had to think, uh, think like, where, where do we stand at the moment? Like, where are we as an organization? Does any one of you know Frédéric Ladoux and the book Reinventing Organizations? So a few people. Cool. So what, what he points out is that uh, organizations sort of have evolved over time. So they started with street gangs, the mafia, or tribal militias who, that relied on power, fear, chaos, command, and authority. Then later on, you had organizations like public schools, governments, traditional churches, and they relied a lot on hierarchy, stability, control, process, formal roles. Then companies evolved even more. And then you have public universities or large corporations who rely on innovation, meritocracy, competition, profit, objectives. Then you, they evolved even more. Then you have companies who um, have like shared values. They want to delight customers. They want to create stakeholder balance. They put culture over strategy. And uh, the guy who actually made this awesome drawing, who's called Peter Green from Agile for All, uh, put in the Agile and the Lean movement within this um, organization type. And Lalu color coded it. So these are the green organizations, and then uh, orange and, and red and uh, amber, I think. And then they uh, evolved even more. And then you have some companies like Patagonia, but also others who sort of have a higher purpose, who do distributed decision making, uh, rely a lot of on, on, on self-management and, and some other types. So basically it's, it's showing how you organize uh, the collaboration. My current boss at Schule im Aufbruch is actually mentioned in the book uh, as one of the uh, teal organizations up here um, for the school that she ran prior to the job that she, uh, the, the work that she's doing now. And at Kyren, um, back in April 2018, um, we sort of looked like this. So we had the CEO, we had four departments, and the education and the product and tech department, operations, and partnerships. <clears throat> and I think in education, it was three teams, product and tech as well. So this is just a simplified version. And what I pointed out here is that depending on the previous work experience that people had, um, you could like assign a color to them, right? So it's not that black and white. People have like a mix of colors in them, but you could see that a lot of people in education, for example, have an academic background, maybe have done a PhD, and they're used to a more hierarchical way of working together. Whereas within product and tech teams, often the de facto standard is like Scrum or some agile methodology of working together. And uh, our management had the idea, okay, we want to change it. We want to create cross-functional teams. So we had the idea, we went to each functional team uh, and presented the idea and we, we got a lot of feedback as well. And some teams just really, really liked the idea. They said, awesome. And other teams were like, no, like I'm not, I'm not in, we're not doing this. So we thought, okay, what, what do we do now, right? <clears throat> There's a great um, uh, quote by, by Otto Sharma from MIT, who's like one of the leading change uh, change management experts, you can say. And he compares like the, the changing um, to, to a field. So he says like the quality of the, uh, of the um, food that you can harvest depends on the soil. And what you have to improve in a company is a social soil. So that means the quality of the relationships that people have with each other. 
and, and, and uses that as a focus. Because the better the quality of the relationships is, especially if it's cross-functional, the better the collaboration is, and then the rest sort of follows. And I really like this as a quote and, and as a metaphor, because a lot of the times it's really hard to tell someone, hey, change, right? <laughs> You are doing this, but I want you to do that. Usually it's not working. So you ha sort of have to, have to find another way to do it. Uh, and what you have to do then is you have the different departments and they're all used to different way of working together. They all have very different expertise, but usually they're really connected regarding the why. So why they want to help refugees with, with access to education, no one ever doubted that. They all applied for, uh, for that job to, because they wanted to do that. But what they differ on is like the how of working together and what, often it's just words. So some people, for example, with a research background would say, okay, we want to be evidence-based. Of course, that means relying on research papers. Whereas if you would talk to a data analyst, you would say like, okay, evidence-based means quantity, like, like data that we get through Google Analytics or some other analytics platform. So what we then decided to do is, after we got the feedback, um, we wrote very detailed responses to each team to just value their opinion and sort of show them, hey, this is like your ideas are, are really helpful. This is going to flow into the process. And we replied and said, okay, this is going to be part of what we'll be doing next. And then we cre created a team that we called the stem cells. So every functional team could send one representative to the stem cell team. And this team was responsible for figuring out a new way for working together that ideally works for the whole company. And my job was to sort of facilitate um, the stem cell team. Uh, interestingly, we ended up with uh, three team leads and most of the heads of the functional team. So they all said, like, I want to be part of this uh, myself to see where it's heading. And then we come to version 0 0.2, which started in June um, 2018. Let me just get a sip of water. So June 2018, we had to figure out what we would do within the stem cell. And this is actually a quote from uh, like the learning sciences or uh, education. It's about developing competencies. And within education, the competency usually is a combination of knowledge and skill and attitudes and values. And a lot of the times, if you try, only try to tell someone, hey, read, read Eric Ries' book uh, or like read the Agile Manifesto, usually you don't internalize it, you can actually practice it. Um, but you also have to develop the skill. And you also, uh, while you do this, you have to sort of develop the attitude and the values to be able to do the kind of work. In the end, it's sort of a, a mindset. And are sure. They, are the colors still uh, connected to the model of the loop? These ones? Yeah, here is also red. And, uh, uh, are and the same colors of the model of the loop? Uh, here, no. Before okay. yeah, yeah. this because one, yes. But remind, it's the same color code. Yeah, yeah. Good, good point. Just, uh, good point. Yeah. You might, you could probably make the case that people within... Uh, yeah, I was quickly trying, but it was not convincing for myself, so this is why... Yeah, I'm interesting. Thinking. I would have to think about it, but good point. <laughs> so we said, okay, we start within the stem cell team. We start like learning by doing, and we used growth hacking as a methodology to start. Is anyone familiar with growth hacking? Yes. Some, okay, so I'm, I'm gonna get back to that again in a bit. So what we did is we started with some templates that you can find online. And it's basically an experiment doc template and a backlog. And people can hand in experiments, and then you have a filter system that says which ex experiment is going through in the backlog, and then you sort of prioritize them based on a few factors. Um, normally, normally within growth hacking, um, there's something called the I score. So that means impact, confidence, and ease. And you score an experiment based on those um, factors. And one thing that we added uh, was projects because it's important to us. Of course, we want to have the impact on the refugees, but we also want to make sure that it's, if it's covered within one of our projects that we need to do it as well. So this was sort of the sorting mechanism for us to decide uh, which experiment is going through and which one isn't. And then the way it works is that everyone sort of gives an experiment a score. So there may be five people in the room, everyone gives a score, you create an average, and in the end you have a total score. 
Um, so in this case, for example, um, the example three only got eight points, example four only got, only got six points, so this one we wouldn't do. Yellow we might do at a later time, but we would definitely do these experiments because they would promise to have a lot of impact. We'd be quite confident that it would work. It wouldn't take too many resources, and uh, it might also be connected to one of our projects, so we can sort of check off a deliverable. So that's what we started with, and at this point um, within the group, this took, I think, maybe two months, between six weeks and two months, and we were sort of happy with the result, uh, and, and the excitement sort of grew within the stem cell, and we decided, okay, now we can split up into a few cross-functional teams, um, and the process of doing that sort of started in September 2018. Um, and we needed to find a way for all the other teams to sort of agree with all those changes. So I wrote down in a constitution all the rules that we had um, uh, that we had decided on within the stem cell for working together. Um, there's an example for the constitution. So there was something in there, in there like this. The heads and the country managers allow team members who are expert within an innovation cluster to spend 20% of their time on it. So we didn't go from uh, we didn't go straight to 100% of the time, but we started with 20% and then wanted to see how it's going. And interestingly, the leadership team, so all the heads of the functional teams agreed, okay, let's do it. People can spend 20% of their time on it. And then uh, this has happened. So basically at this point in time, we had two different ways of working together. We had the functional teams down here and at the same time, we had the cross-functional teams up here. So we had the stem cell that now split up into three clusters, uh, and 20% of people's time would go into this, and we also scaled from, 20, from 10 people to 22 people. And uh, actually, in, at this point, um, I, my son was born, <laughs> so I said, awesome, we managed to uh, sort of split up in three clusters now, and I went on parental leave, and I said, awesome, I'm gonna come back, Everything is going to working, be working really well. <laughs> Fantastic. So I, I got back in, Feb, in uh, January uh, and, and we sort of checked what was happening and realized um, it didn't go as well. So if I go back to this one, basically what happened is that the three clusters relied uh, on 20% of the time from here. Um, but they met for two hours or so and the work that they had decided on sort of conflicted with the work that was happening here. And I mean, it's not that uh, they had any less work than before, right? Quite, quite to the contrary. So uh, basically we went from 100% of work to 120% and it just didn't work. So there, was, there were a lot of tensions at that point in time. And uh, what we decided then is the three cluster leads, so it was Vera, Baptiste and Shana who led each of those clusters, uh, recommended that we start um, giving the time like uh, for one day and the management agreed. So we started with Innovation Thursday, so everyone at the company would have to join one day a week for cross-functional work uh, and all of a sudden we had more time available for it. And we blocked the calendars so you couldn't book any meeting rooms on that day in the week. Uh, and uh, it was, uh, all of it would go into uh, cross-functional collaboration. And also we had more people joining. So we went from roughly 20 people to 50 people. And you can also see that within the stem cells, uh, more and more people sort of converted from uh, orange to green. So they got more used to agile working. And a lot of the times it's just that they're afraid of a, another way of working together. It's not that they just don't want to do it, but as soon as they experience it and they experience the value and they experience that, uh, they can have a larger impact through that way of working together. They become interesting and at some point they become hooked and tell others. Uh, and then that's also the point in time when you can sort of scale a little bit and add more people. They were free to choose which um, cross-functional team they want to join? Um, were, it was... They were stable cross-functional teams or somehow... They, in the beginning, these were, these were more stable, so the cluster leads would agree with the heads of the functional teams and the person that wanted to join, whether that's fine or not. So some wanted to, some didn't, but they also, the heads of the functional teams sort of had to sign off on it. Uh, and at this point in time, um, they were sort of free to choose more, like they would move more freely between teams. So it would, 
sort of depend on their skill as well. So there was one topic coming up here, and then they said, hey, it would be cool if you could join. So it all started to blur a little bit more. And what we did then is that I realized I had sort of facilitated the stem cell for a few months at that point in time, uh, and then realized that this would sort of take resources from the cluster teams and from these teams as well. So we just faded it out, which was also quite painful for me because when I was sort of facilitating this group, a lot of people came with questions and, hey, how do we do this? How do we do that? But uh, at that point in time, it just didn't make any sense anymore. So I sort of cut myself out of the equation and also pushed for the cluster leads who were doing really, really good work in facilitating these groups um, to, uh, to get more time available. So because this on Innovation Thursday still meant 20% uh, per person, but the leads to facilitate, you need some prep time, you need some time afterwards. Um, uh, so we changed that as well. There was a question there. Yeah, so I was just curious what happened to the people in the stem cell, and what did you use for the It sounds like the stem cell was working pretty well in terms of capabilities and uh, where you're working. Mm -hmm. so what, what happened to that team? So the stem cell, basically people from within the stem cell moved over into these clusters. So it's not a separate team. And the reason for the stem cell was mostly to sort of learn by doing and to experiment and to find a new way of working together. But the goal was always to split up at some point. And so can I ask a quick question? Yeah, sure. So did you see like a big uh, change in behavior with the, with the teams on the right after you put the uh, well-performing team, other uh, people from the well-performing team into the groups? Sorry, say it again? And so was there a big difference once the stem cell people started to work in the other teams? I'm sorry, maybe I'm not being very clear. Um, I'm wondering if, if when the, the people from the stem cell went into the other teams, that the behavior in the other teams changed at all? Um, I mean, these teams, these people, basically what happened, um, people from within the stem cell moved into these teams, so they would sort of have a leadership role within, role within these teams as well. Uh, and. I can't say whether their behavior changed, but they were really like helpful to get all the other people within this, these groups to sort of yeah, see the value. Yeah. yeah. And then also, again, we, we sort of stopped with the stem cell. Uh, and at the same time, I tried to like push some, uh, which I like to call systemic acu acupuncture points. So uh, there's a few ways that you can help the organization to sort of adapt a more user-centered way of working together. What works really well is to do user interviews and record them and sort of have them spread through the organizations. You always found, find out very, very interesting things, especially with the refugees. So we had some refugees who live in a, um, in a refugee camp in Kenya, but then also some people who were still based in Syria. And just to hear their stories gives everyone a boost in terms of motivation, but, but also really helps to focus the product more on what they really need. Same with user-centered KPIs. A lot of the times what, what's important in a nonprofit is like your project deliverables and making sure that you check them off. But it's good to sort of balance that with user-centered KPIs to sort of channel all the, uh, all the motivation in, in one direction. We also at the same point uh, sort of simplified the project deliverable tracking. And at that point also we have a, had a workshop with Podojo and we had lots of people coming in uh, to help people uh, yeah, find out um, how to work in a more agile or lean way. Okay, so what happened here then within the cross-functional team, at some point um, the lines were sort of blurring. What you asked uh, earlier that you couldn't tell anymore really which was which cluster, but you had like four, five or six or seven different working groups similar to a bar camp working on each day. Uh, on each Innovation Thursday, and at the same time, um, you also had more and more people joining. People would take over work from Innovation Thursday to other days of the week, and you could sort of feel the momentum and the, the movement growing. Uh, and then this is what happened then in version 0.5 in August 2019, is that um, we decided to um, sort of move over from Innovation Thursday to have innovation basically 100% of um, innovation time on, on like during the whole week. Um, and we created, I think it's uh, now five teams um, that we call EdTech. So the education departments and the product and tech departments sort of merged. And um, 
started with yeah, five agile teams at the time. Yeah, so I sort of wrote down the whole change story. If you um, not Google it, but Ecosia it, uh, you can find it under, uh, on tbd.com. Um, uh, it's like an article series basically called How We Create an Innovation Ecosystem. It's a little longer, so this is a short version of it. And you can find more, um, more find out more about it if, if you find it interesting. And then now I work for Schule im Aufbruch. Um, again, is a network of more than 100 schools with a focus on sustainability, project-based learning, and future skills. And um, what I'm doing now at Schule im Aufbruch is that we do a lot of co-creations with, with children and teachers. So usually, if we have a network meeting, we also invite children. Um, and it's always really powerful to have the voice of the people you want to help in the room. A lot of the times, people, grown-ups or adults, discuss education, and there's no children around. If you ask the children, is that what you want? A lot of the times, no, I want this. So they have a very clear idea of what they want. We try to, or we always um, validate our value and our impact very early on. We have a mix of funding streams, which is helpful. So we don't only want to rely on project funding, but we also have some social business initiatives going on. Also, we get some donations from individual contributors. Uh, what was interesting as well, um, we had a talk with our, um, the foundation that, that funds us. It's called Schöpflin Stiftung and the Software AG Stiftung and asked them, hey, is there a more flexible way for us to do our work? And they said, yeah, sure, it's fine. You can just sort of share the roadmap that you have, uh, and, and we use that. And if you change things on it, we, we don't mind as long as you tell us why. Uh, and this is really helpful for us because it gives us some, some flexibility. And what I'm working on as well is an impact innovation portfolio um, where you have an overview more visually uh, and you can sort of see uh, how are we doing with funding, uh, how are we doing with impact, uh, and where are we, uh, in, in what phase are we in, so that you can sort of distinguish the different initiatives and sort of um, yeah, be more focused when you, uh, when you work in some of this. Yeah, and that was basically it. So questions? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I, I would say it was more organized through the way that it was a bit of a, a bit of a bar camp. Um, so people would uh, sort of sign up for things, and if you didn't get too many people, maybe probably it wasn't important enough for enough other people to work on it. So it was a bit of a mix of, of of different things, but it was not like that we sort of told people what team to go into, um, but mostly it was through the topics that we chose and then. Yeah, we just talked to them, asked, do you want to join? Sometimes they said yes, sometimes they said, well, I have this really interesting other thing, I mean, and that was fine too. Yeah? So in the last round, when the teams came to the, uh, the innovation teams basically uh, got established in your organizations, uh, so then how did they go, so do they still like define experiments for themselves, or do they like take out part of the, Mm. Um, we we still it, it's a bit of a mix as well. Um, normally, it, it we, like I mean we do some of the experiments still, and we sort of of course measure like the, our work against it. Um, but a lot of the times the, the other work um, is, is still being done. So someone usually is saying like, we can't do, we can't do this without keeping on doing that. Um, so it, it sort of worked it, itself out in a way. Yeah? Could I see the farmer slide again? Standing in the way? Sure. The last before, the very last. Mm -hmm. Ah, this one. Ah, okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Oh, the next one. Yeah. Mm, sorry, the Schule im Aufbruch, the 
this one? Yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah, sure. Sorry, um, and like I, I suppose like uh, not everybody is uh, um, like uh, likes to uh, work in an agile way. Like, uh, did everybody enjoy it, or did people leave because of changing the style of work, or or did you do it so smoothly that people could adjust? Mm. Like p people didn't leave in 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 big numbers, let's put it that way. I am sure that there are some people who felt a little less valued. I mean, some people also like lost the role that they had previously. Yeah. So if they had moved from a head of rule to role to being an expert in a, in a cross-functional team. But um, I didn't witness any, like it wasn't a lot of people. Okay, so you did it smoothly. It was quite smoothly, yeah. 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 But <laughs> yeah, it also really depends on the culture. I'm sure that there are some companies that um, really look at the numbers and they can be quite harsh, but I mean, within a non-profit, um, it, it's, it's really tricky to, um, to do it without taking the people with you. Uh, and especially at Chiron, I mean, it, it's one of the few like larger um, social businesses or non-profits that I know that also have a work council very early on. So it's a very democratic culture. So if you have work council elections going on, usually you would have some election posters in the hallways and it's something that people were really proud of. So it would not have worked if we would have said uh, all the way in the beginning, like, no, we're going to do this uh, and, and pushed. Uh, I think it would have been uh, a disaster. Mm -hmm. So it was good to, so for us to build it up slowly. Any more questions? Sure. Yes, so um, to me it seemed like the um, model worked out very well, but as far as I understood, you implemented it this way for the first time, right? Mm -hmm. So if you were in a scenario where we would have to implement it for a second time, what would you do differently? That's a good question. Um, when I did this, I there's one really um, good book that the uh, CPO, the, the chief product officer, gave to me uh, as, a, as a farewell gift. It's called uh, Brave New Work um, by a company called The Ready. And they have a canvas that's basically the rules of working together. So you have, I think, 12 different categories, authority and some other things. And I think it would have been really valuable to sort of map out what the system is at the moment. So what I showed with Lalu early on, that you sort of make it more tangible that like we have a hierarchy, there's other ways of working together. Because as soon as you, as you make it tangible, you can discuss it and you can change it. And you can sort of keep score similar to how you do it with a business model canvas over time. And the other thing that I didn't know back then that I know now is um, the liberating structures um, that I think would have been really valuable as well. Uh, I don't know if, are you all familiar with liberating structures? So it's a, basically a, um, it's a book called Liberating Structures and in there you have 33 structures and one for example is an open space or a bar camp. So they sort of curated 33 different uh, ways of making teams um, collaborate. So workshop settings, one really a simple liberating structure is one, two, four, all. So first, if you, if you present an idea or a challenge, uh, one person writes down what they would do, then they discuss it with another person for one minute, it's all time boxed, then they would discuss it in fours, and then they would discuss it within a big group. Uh, and then you can have sort of liberating structure strings, so you can connect different formats with each other. And that's really helpful, especially when you have a bigger group setting. And what we did in the stem cell at the beginning, also because we had a few people um, remotely, we would just talk a lot. And um, sometimes we would use post-its uh, for certain aspects, but then we would have to put the webcam in a way that other people would be able to see it. And uh, it, it was a little, it wasn't that um, yeah, fluid or that simple. Uh, and I think through being more on paper, through the um, operating system canvas, that's a canvas, um, that's what the canvas is called from the book, uh, Brave New Work, but also through liberating structures. I think we could have made it more quickly or people would have been involved more than just through words. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thanks. I have one or two more questions, but then we want to move on to anything that you want to touch. Yeah. Sure. Did, did you 
you decide on rules? Because I mean, a lot of people could uh, just um, ruin everything by being negative all the time. Um, did you dis did you make up rules for giving critique or who was in the group? Yeah, who was in the group or I mean, what kind of competition? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the I mean the the culture at Kyron is is always even though they may think differently that everyone's very polite. So. We didn't have to have many of these rules. A lot of the times also it sort of figures itself out because if someone is a bit more harsh then someone else is gonna say, hey, don't, don't act like this. Um, so we didn't have to create any rules or we didn't have to speak them out. Usually there was also something that we sort of have yeah, figured out on our own. Yeah? So out of those innovation Thursdays, like did any initiative or breakthrough come up that you were like, oh wow, Um, I mean, it was always amazing to see how much people get, can get done in a day. I remember that um, I think some uh, one team figured out, like we had to come up with a um, like sign-off process on a mobile phone for international students as part of a project. And I think it took them a day to sort of map out the whole flow of the app, uh, including like a first sort of clickable prototype. They, in the morning they said, hey, this is what we want to do. In the evening they said, hey, here's our clickable prototype, which was awesome. So it was amazing to see how, how quickly you can be also if you just have that time box of one day and in the evening you want to show something. So that was really cool. Um, and then the other aspect was just stories because, I mean, we have an office in Jordan and in Lebanon and, and in Germany. Uh, but basically any refugee in the world can, can use the platform. They have to uh, sort of upload and like something that says that they're a refugee. Um, but that also, you had very diverse needs on the student end. Um, so for example, some of the refugees in the um, refugee camp in Kenya, uh, they would have a mobile, or they would have one laptop connected to a projector and then they would watch the online course within a class. So there were 20 people within a the class, then like hooking up on a projector and then making notes on paper. Um, and that was really interesting as well. So you did learn a lot through all the experiments that we were able to do there and sort of learn to focus. Okay, I would say, going to the same part, but they don't go. Yeah, I'll, yeah. yeah. Thank you.